This is the Sales Gravy Podcast. I'm Jeb Blunt, best-selling author of Fanatical Prospecting and Sales EQ, and I'm here to help you open more doors, close bigger deals, and rock your commission check. If you are a new sales leader, an aspiring sales leader, or an inspired leader, you're going to love this week's episode where I discuss leading sales teams in rapid growth and rapidly changing environments with my friend Will Frattini, who is a top sales leader at ZoomInfo, one of my favorite sales tools. Before we jump in, though, a short message about one of my other favorite companies, Paycom. Now, you've heard me talk about Paycom in the past and why it's such a great place to take your sales career. From world-class training to an engaged leadership team dedicated to helping you succeed to amazing benefits and the ability to earn a lot of money, Paycom has it all. And I believe in this company so much that I encouraged my own son to intern there. And he called me this week to tell me how much fun he was having and how much he was learning. He was so excited. And one of the things that struck me is that he went on and on and on about how blown away he was that Jeff York, Paycom's chief sales officer and one of the greatest sales strategists on the planet, spent time with the interns sharing his wisdom and advice. So if you've got talent, a winning mindset, and the will to be the best, Paycom is the company for you. Go check out all their career opportunities at paycom.salesgravy.com. That's paycom.salesgravy.com. And even if you're not looking right now, I promise it's worth taking a sneak peek. Go to paycom.salesgravy.com and check out everything that Paycom has to offer. Now, here's my conversation with Will Fertini on leading salespeople in rapidly changing environments. Thanks for making some time today. My name is Will Frattini. I'm one of uh, the directors of new business sales here at ZoomInfo, recently acquired by Discover Org. I'm here with Jeb Blunt, a fantastic author of Fanatical Prospecting, uh, Sales EQ, um, and most recently, People Follow You. He heads up everything that goes on over at Sales Gravy and just adds so much value to our world. So I'm just so pleased to be with you here, Jeb. Thanks so much for making time. Well, thank you for having me on. My entire team uses Zoom Info. Uh, we use it every single day. It's part of this integrated to our CRM. And it's always a pleasure to have an opportunity to spend time with an accomplished sales leader uh, and someone who res- is respected within your team as you are. Thanks, Jim. So, look, I, I think there's so many things I would want to pick your brain about. But I think what we're talking a lot about here is as we're going through so much growth and so much change, um, there's a need for rapid deployment of new sales leadership, right? And historically, sales leaders are, you know, come from within types, right? It's, it's pretty comfortable and common for most companies to want to promote from within. We've had some great success of actually finding folks externally, but have also come up the ranks through sales. You usually don't find someone who leaves finance to go lead a sales team. Um, love our finance friends too, obviously. But I, I wanted your take on how you find it's important to kind of become an effective sales leader and be comfortable leaving, you know, I think Steve Lucas said once, like, it's not about getting your own trophies anymore. It's about getting your team trophies, right? So how, how do you feel like if I were a brand new salesperson listening to this webinar that just got promoted into a management role, how, how, would, how would you focus them in on their first, you know, 30, 60, 90 days in that new role? It's, it's a great question. And, and, you know, when I go back to the days when I was running really large sales organizations, uh, and I remember it as a VP of sales, this is one of the big quandaries that we had because we would bring in uh, or promote from within one of our top salespeople into a sales management role, and then they would blow the sales team up. And it was usually because they had a really hard time making the transition from it's all about me and what I close and what I deliver. And now it's about the team. So it's about, it's about me standing back behind the team and helping them get better. And a lot of new sales leaders have that problem. Uh, we ended up putting people through a 12 month process of getting them ready for those roles because of, of, 
that issue. And it's a big issue. And even then, even after we went through all that training, those leaders still struggled with taking a step back and making it about their salespeople who serving their salespeople versus um, their salespeople serving them about, you know, them taking the spotlight. And Part of that's just because of who we are. You know, we as salespeople, we have to be a little bit egotistical. We have to be a little bit driven. We have to be, you know, focused on our own need for achievement. And making that emotional step back is is difficult. So I think that the the way that I've always explained it to, to to sales leaders who are brand new is this: if you look at your paycheck as a sales leader, you get paid for what your people do, not for what you do, and, and therefore anything that you do that impedes their ability to produce, to, to generate a paycheck for you is not in your best interest. And you have to recognize that every single thing that you do as a, as a leader has an impact on their productivity. And, and salespeople are funny that way. I mean, you can walk in in the morning and say the wrong thing, look at them the wrong way, do the wrong thing. They're, they're looking at you and they're making a decision about how they're going to do or manage their day based on that relationship or based on an action that you take. And, and for new sales leaders, they have to remember they are always on stage, always on stage. So the most important thing for a new sales leader is a number one, principle number one, understand this, you get paid for what your people do, not for what you do. You need them more than they need you. And if you start with that premise, then you can be a leader. But until you, you, you internalize that and you own that, you need them more than they need you, it's gonna be very, very difficult for you to build relationships with your people, to ask them to do the hard things that we have to ask salespeople to do and get them to want to do it for you, uh, it's gonna be difficult and, uh, and you're gonna struggle. And in some cases, if you don't get it, you're gonna blow the sales team up and you're gonna be back in the seat making phone calls versus leading. Which isn't a bad thing. Some people decide to do that, right? But yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean. You know, in my personal experience, I've done it wrong before I think I'm slowly starting to do it right. I still have many years to go, right? But I think one of the lessons I had to learn through even some of my team members having the confidence to come to me and say, hold on, is that I had a new customer. It took me a while to realize that my customer was no longer just the Zoom Info customer audience. It was my people, right? And, you know, the same the same quandary I had where I was selling some info is I'd say, I know every salesperson in the world needs direct dials. Why is this so hard for you? Right. But I can't say that that's not the way selling the system works. I had to work consultatively. I had to do problem solving. I had to do solution selling. So now my customers are my people. So it's, I want to go buy a house this year. It's not go buy direct dials or, or go sell direct dials. Go make a hundred phone calls. It's I want to buy a house. So how do you get to buying a house? Right. You save a bunch of money. How do you save money? You got to make money. How do you make money? You got to go close deals. Right. And, I think that's where the longer it takes for someone to be empowered to have a space where they can feel comfortable saying, you know what, you are my customer and sacrificing that one deal that I might micromanage better than you, Ms. or Ms. Sales Rep, I'm going to big picture it and think about how I can actually empower you to achieve your goals and that will in turn achieve our customers' goals. Um, it took me a long time to figure that out though. I, I don't know if you've had one of those aha moments. One of my reps took me out to lunch and she's like, you're a good rep, but I don't want to be you. <laughs> She's like, I like you, but I don't want to be you. So can you please just take a step back for a minute? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you've, there's so much that you just said that, you, that we can unpack there. One of the things is like, you know, you, I, I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I've made a lot of mistakes along the way as a leader. And I still make, I mean, I've run a big company. I mean, say a big company, big training company. And we have, you know, a bunch of salespeople here and I still screw things up. I still make mistakes. I still sometimes over-engineer or micromanage a deal versus allowing them to work the deal on their own. Uh, and I, I think that as a leader, you have to become comfortable with the fact that you're not going to be perfect and you're going to screw things up. And it's okay. The most important thing is, is knowing that you made the mistake and being able to go back and apologize for it and fix it. And what I have found about people is that people really dig it when leaders are authentic, when they're real, um, when they are willing to say, I don't know, or I'm sorry, those things are important. Uh, but I'll tell you that the, when you asked about aha moment, it came from me. I, I became a brand new sales manager. I was the number one rep in my company. And I asked to get promoted, like a lot of number one reps do. <laughs> and they gave me a sales team. And it was uh, the sales team was not in great shape. It was uh, the worst sales team in our company. And I took over, and it was, it was a mess. And my aha moment came when I was sitting down with one of my reps and, and who had been struggling, but it started getting a lot better. 
And I, I asked him what he wanted. Like, what do you want? Like, what do you want to accomplish? What's important to you? What do you want? And I didn't do it. Like, it wasn't somebody told me to do that. I was just having a conversation and it came out. And I remember that he looked at me and didn't, he, he didn't really know. Like, he couldn't define it. He, he, he wanted things, but he couldn't define it. So I sat down with him and I said, what do you want? And like you said, he wanted a house. He wanted to buy a house, wanted to move his kids to a new neighborhood. I uh, wanted a swimming pool. Uh, he wanted to save some money. There was a bunch of stuff that he wanted to accomplish in his life. So we took those things on a piece of paper and then we took all of the activities that, that would that equal getting a new house and we dialed into that and dialed into his income and we just basically mathematic the entire thing. So we put everything down and then I stopped talking about sales activity and I started talking about house. And uh, his numbers went, like he got better quick. So I immediately got a clue and went to the other nine salespeople on my team and sat down with them and created goal sheets for each one of them. What do you want? What do you want to accomplish? And then took all of their numbers and dialed it in. And then I focused on helping them get what they wanted. Now, not everybody performed, not everybody. Some sure. people broke my heart, let me down, right? But most of my people, they, they immediately got better because we were focusing on what was important to them. It's the old Zig Ziglar quote, right? If you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. But it goes back to you get paid for what they do, not what you do. So I did that. And and this was just, it was just sort of an organic, natural thing. But but oh my goodness gracious, they they got so much better. We went from last place in the, in the country out of 52 sales teams to first place in nine months. Mm. And it was all about learning to focus on what was important to them rather than what was important to me. And then the other thing that I had to learn early on, and I made this mistake and I had a similar conversation because I had someone sit down with me when I reps and say, you know, I don't really want to be you (laughs) because I have my own way of selling my own way of doing things. And I had to learn that everybody has a different way of doing things. And it's important that when you're coaching, you're not coaching a style or a belief or the way someone does something, you're focusing on the behavior that generates the outcome. And once I could get away from that, and and a lot of that was my own ego, like I just wanted people to do it my way. Once I figured that out, it was interesting to see how some people would go down this path and some people would go down that path. And if I just focused on the core behaviors and coached those behaviors, the, the, the things that got deals into the pipeline and the activities that move deals and advance deals through a pipeline to close, negotiating, all those things, my people got a lot better. And then they could have their own style, their own way of doing things. They could be authentic. And, and I didn't get in the way and make them feel small because I was saying, your way is not as good as my way. Does that make yep. sense? It totally does. I mean, it, it's such a personal it's a relationship, right? Like, you know, one of my pet peeves is when a salesperson says, I want to build a relationship with you, Ms. Customer. It's like, you can't say that, but that's true, right? Like we have to build a foundation that is built around not, Hey, I need you to go make a hundred cold calls a day. So you can set 40 demos and you can create 30 ops and you can close 30% of them, right? That, that doesn't equate. But by saying, tell me what you care about. Tell me the things that make you, you tell me why you come to work every day and what you're hoping to achieve. Like, that then creates the foundation that you build this sales castle, maybe we call it that, around. And I think that's that's for me that I feel so fortunate to work in an organization that embraces create relationships with your people that are more so than just punch a clock, come to work, do your job, don't do your job, get fired, don't get fired. You know, it's we we are so much more than just a numbers shop. But I'm a very analytical mind. I mean, look at my, that's my board behind me. Like I, that's nonsense to most sales reps. They're like, what is that? Right. But like, that's how I make sense of it. But I make the hard part focusing on, you know, creating a space in my one-on-ones for what do you need for me? You know, what is it that you're you know, running into this week? What did I do wrong? Right. Um, creating that personal connection as a leader. I feel like, you know, what you've just described resonates to me in a big way because it, you're making it less about the company, the, the revenue, the dollar. You're making it about your people, making it personal, and that turns into those results inevitably anyway, right? You're exactly right. And the, you know, I think that the, the, the you, said, you said something really important. Leadership is personal. It's human. Um, if, you, if you just think about your life, anybody who is watching or listening to this, if you just think about all the leaders in your life, the, the people that you would run through a wall for were the ones that you really were connected to emotionally. And those leaders did something that, that created an environment that made you want to do things for them. 
and, and we're not talking about, when we start thinking about personal, we're not talking about kumbaya, right? Sitting around, we're not talking about trying to get everybody to like you. In fact, it really doesn't make a difference if your people like you or not. It makes a difference if you like them. Um, and that's really important because they know whether you like them or that you don't like them. It's important that you got to understand that as a leader, especially in sales, you have to ask people to do things that are unnatural. It is unnatural to make a hundred cold calls a day and interrupt people, strangers that you don't know and get rejected. So if you have to have people that have a relationship with you and believe in you, if you're going to get them to get over some of those humps and some of those fears and to do things that are uncomfortable. And it does begin with the relationship, but I, I love what you said you know you don't say i really want to build a relationship with you the relationship happens because you care because because you take the time in your one-to-one -to, -one to say tell me about this what's happening there uh that you spend time with them side by side on the floor or in their cars or wh wherever you're, you can interact with them and you're working with them all the time and you know the i i think that when you know when when i start thinking about you know the the relationship and and how you create those relationships i go back to when we, when i wrote uh, people follow you we did 300 interviews with leaders and we interviewed a lot of sales leaders who were really good at what they did. And when, what I mean by that is they didn't just like show up and have a good year. They had a good year and a good year and a good year and a good year and a good year. They were always on, on top of the ranking report. Uh, and they were a lot like you. They had all the numbers on the wall. I love it. Like when I go, when I walk into any place, I can see the numbers on the wall. I know we're in a place where, you know, there's no ambiguity about where people stand. And these leaders were the same way. But when we went and asked their, the salespeople that work for them, so we, why, why do you think that Bill or Mary or, you know, Susie, why, why are these sales leaders so good at what they do? The, to the person, the, the salespeople would say, she knows exactly who I am. She knows my family. She knows my friends. She knows my life. She knows what I want. She does those things and she's always working to help me get what I want. And you could over and over and over and over, you would hear that. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why I think like being a sales, you know, sales leader is so, it's like the best job in, in business because you can build your own tribe, like this whole group of people that are around you and because of variable income commission checks, you literally can work with them and help them point to the stands where they're going to hit their ball uh, and, and you can make their life better and you can impact them. And I, and I, and it's the reason why if I look back on my entire career over 30 years, the job that I loved the most of every job that I had, I had a bunch of them was leading salespeople frontline, you know, 10 salespeople on my team, my tribe, you know, my group of people that would do anything for me. And we got to celebrate together. We got to go through it diversity together and uh, and they're still my friends today because their lives are better because I was able to invest in them. And it's so important. I mean, like I said, I think you hit on this earlier too, but being comfortable, um, I, I kind of say this, be okay with surprising the people who work for you. And and humility is such a core of that. Like be surprise them to not always be the one with the answers, right? That was a lesson that took me a little too long to learn. But you know, I found that having the same empathic experience with somebody like, you know, we just got acquired. We'll talk about that. We got acquired. And at first we didn't know what that meant because nobody knew about it ahead of time on the sales team. But then we found out and we were uncertain and we were a little unsure. But instead of me saying, don't be uncertain, go back to selling. I said, hey, this is an, this is an uncertain time. We don't, we don't know everything yet. Sure enough, we all got together in a, the shortest amount of time I could have ever imagined that my team could have ever gotten through this and come out in aces. I mean, we've done 130% of our quota the month we got acquired. Like I'm so proud beyond words of them, but we did that because we all experienced these emotions together. And it was, I was able to have some humility to say, I don't have all the answers. I will go find them for you. I I'm feeling very good about this acquisition. I, th I see a lot of really good things, which continues to be true. And but let's go figure out the things that we don't know for sure together. Let's not pretend that I'm the man in the high castle that knows everything. And I'll tell you what I know when I know it, right? It's just more of this empathic, humble, you know, things that we're afraid to do because we in sales have egos and we don't want to always not know the answers, right? But those are so important. And I think you brought that up earlier. That, that really is a core of what makes my leadership philosophy kind of flow. Um, I, I think you're, I, I, I hope people are listening to what you said because, and if I go back to, the worst sales leader that I ever worked for. It was, it was like talking to a piece of cardboard. 
Um, you know, if there, if, if we did something, I worked for it in an industry that was a really tough industry and our company would change something. It was a change that was going to negatively impact the sales organization. Instead of him saying, listen, this is going to be tough. We, we have to do this. I get it. We, you know, this is, this is life, but it's going to be tough and it's going to be hard. Like you said, we're going to go out and talk about this and have a conversation. He was, you know, smile on his face. Oh, this is going to be perfect. It's going to be great. And I've got all the answers and I've got this. And I just despised working for this guy just because of that. And that doesn't mean that as a leader, you aren't obligated to toe the company line. You are. Sure. And it doesn't mean as a leader, you're not obligated to do things and ask your team to do things that aren't going to be fun or, or easy or um, things that they're going to like to do. But I think that people need to see that you're a human being just like them and that you have real emotions just like them and you're willing to sit down and allow them to talk about it and have a conversation. And it, it, it reminds me of a, a, a study that was done, and I think it was at Stanford, and maybe I'm, I may be wrong about that, but they, they took two groups of uh, employees and they put them in a room and they had to make a really tough change at this company. And it was something that no one was going to like. With one group, they walked through the door and they said, here's what the change is going to be. Here's why you're going to love it. Here's everything about it. Where's what we're going to do? And they made the change. With the other group of people, they said, um, tell us about how you feel about this. And they let them talk and they complain and they whined and whatever they, but they talked it out and then they made the change anyway. And then they went back and asked each group of people how satisfied they were with that particular change. And the group of people who were told what the change was going to be, um, they were very unsatisfied, very happy, very unhappy. Um, productivity had lowered. The group of people who had had an opportunity to talk about it and had the leaders sit there and listen to them, they made the change anyway. They were pretty okay with it. They weren't happy, but they were they were satisfied and, and productivity hadn't dipped and life was good. And so as a leader, you've got to recognize that, you know, sometimes you just have to sit and listen and, uh, and spend time with people and not have all the answers and not feel like you have to have all the answers. And by the way, if we go back to brand new salespeople, that's one of the big issues that they have is that they feel like they have to have the answer for everything. And if anybody brings them a question or what have you, they have to make sure that they know everything and no one grows in that situation. The leader doesn't grow and the people don't grow. Yeah. I mean, and that's, we talk about the climate economically that we're in, right? Like working, you know, working in short sprints is the norm. Now people don't go and work at a company, one company for 30 years, retire on a pension at 65 and, you know, go live in Hilton Head. Good for those that do. I have, my wife's aunt and uncle are, I reckon Kathy, like that's awesome. But at the same time, working at, the speed of change is so important, right? And and I think that's where I'm learning this firsthand. Um, and I've learned this in other ways, thankfully, <laughs> up until this point. But this idea of things that make us anxious, if we repress them and push them away and are the cardboard cutouts telling everybody to smile and wave, that, that doesn't yield the result you want, right? Just like when a client gives an objection, Right. And says, well, I don't want to pay for that. And then we try to say, well, you should pay for it. You're not digging into the point of what the actual problem was. You're not you're not being consultative. You're not pivoting and understanding. OK, well, why did you just say that? So in the speed of change, when when a company is acquired, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Let's talk about that. Let's get in a room. Let's create a safe space. Let's all be on the same page. Let's all experience this together as opposed to creating dissonance where, you know, I'm the manager, so I have to tell you what you need to know and go do your job and let me worry about that stuff. I think we just covered that, but like it, we could probably come up with many different scenarios of how that's relevant, not just into, in, into a sales leadership role, but leadership in general. Right. And, and people don't, people don't just follow because to, it goes back to the beginning of our conversation. Like you have to build that foundational relationship first, which takes time. You have to build trust. You have to have humility so that when that change happens, you know, people have to be able to say, oh, I actually know you and trust you. So what, what we're taught, what we're going through together, I actually know you have empathy for me. Right. And, and that's, a, that's, I think that's an important thing that you just said about, and you just, you brought up trust, but, but if you just think about leadership as a whole, and especially sales leadership, you cannot have a, a leadership relationship with anyone if you don't start with trust. And just like you said, with the relationship, I want to build, you know, I want to build a relationship with you. You can't say to people, I want you to trust me because they don't. And, you know, I would give you that, you know, we went back to the 1960s and 1950s that 
and you were a leader, in most cases, you know, people walked into the relationship and they gave you the benefit of the doubt and they gave you trust. But, you know, Pew Research, um, the uh, Associated Press, uh, uh, GNK Associated Poll, um, if, you, if you start looking at some of the polls and, and some of the surveys today, we've, we've moved into a world where most people don't trust other people. And, and especially the, the Generation Z and, and Millennials, um, they don't walk into the relationship and say, gosh, I really trust you and I, and I believe you. That trust has to be built one brick at a time. It's one thing that you do. It's uh, it's one question that you ask. It's the it's the one to one that you that you have and you consistently have. You don't like cancel it because you got emails or cat videos to watch, right? It's being on the floor with your people all the time. Uh, it's it's asking about their you know their situation and it's recognizing by the way that that when you're doing a hard change or making a hard change, that everybody's going to confront that change differently. They're all individuals. And just because you're a person that can, you know, quickly, you know, pull the bandaid off and just move forward doesn't mean all your people are going to be doing that as well. So I think you have to, you have to think about every day, what are you doing? And this is the old uh, Stephen Covey, uh, seven habits, uh, analogy, but you have to be thinking as a leader every day, what am I doing to fill up the trust bank account? What am I doing to build trust? You're going to break trust. I guarantee you will. But you, what are you doing to fill it up, to build trust with your people so that when you are in a situation where you have a major change like you guys have just gone through, or even a small change, that people are willing to give you the benefit of the doubt and they're willing to listen to you and they're willing to step forward and do something that's uncomfortable because of the relationship with you because it's personal. Uh, I, I, um, I, you know, I always think about, um, you know, when, when I, back when I was a sales leader, my wife would um, get mad at me because uh, I would be on the phone with one of my salespeople at 11 o'clock at night, you know, having a conversation with them, or they would be in my driveway, you know, sitting there and we're, you know, we're, we're going back and forth over something. And my wife would say, why are you like, why are you in your, with your salespeople like all the hours of the night? I'm like, cause they're having personal issues. Like they, you know, they're, 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 they've had a boyfriend or a girlfriend problem. They're having family problem, kid problem, somebody's sick. What they got, you know, they're, they're having doubts about themselves. And I said, tomorrow morning, when they come into work, I need them to be awesome because they're going to be standing in front of all my customers and I'm not going to be there. So I have to do that. And all of those little things, the investment that you make in, in their lives. And, I, and I, I know some people are probably listening and think that's just crazy that you would do that. But I do believe that, that sales is different. The people that you're dealing with are emotional and, they, yeah. and I need them to be on when the game starts. So that, that means that 11 o'clock at night, I'm talking to someone off a ledge. I have to do that. But all of that, you know, when you pull that together, that builds that foundation of trust that you need as a leader when you have something that you have to pull people through that's going to be difficult for them to deal with. Yeah, my... I don't know if everyone listening to the webinar or watching the webinar will understand the reference, but my wife and I literally have a name for that. It's the Coach Taylor Syndrome from Friday Night Lights. Because, <laughs> um, you know, in the TV show, his players will show up at off hours and they go to him as the kind of, you know, figure in their life that they trust. Him. And my wife and I do have candid conversations, though, and this is important. I'll, I'll say this for anyone that needs to hear it, too. I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you just said and a little ambivalence it is important to create boundaries as with every relationship, right? Yes. Because we, we would be so available. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, I, I hope my whole team hears me say this cause I know I would say this to them in person too. The, the time we invest should be the time worth getting returned back on. Right? So if I have a conversation with somebody at 10 o'clock at night about something, I know they can figure out themselves and I empower them to believe that they can figure it out. And I know it could wait until tomorrow and I'm neglecting my time with my family that's not a good investment of time. So setting that boundary in a relationship early too, it's not because I don't want to talk to you at 10 o'clock at night. It's because I believe that if you have something you can solve yourself, you know, you shouldn't interrupt me and Tammy Taylor at the dinner table, you know, telling us about, Oh my gosh, I got this emergency I need to solve. And that's, that's one of the prouder moments for me too. You know, I have a couple of specific people I'm thinking of as I'm saying this out loud, but I got a text last night and it was, Hey, I need some help around this contract. They're going to sign tomorrow. Uh, his manager was on the email too. Uh, and he goes, you know what? Don't, don't reply to this. It's family time. I'll get back to you in the morning. And we have that built already where we we've gone to battle at 11 o'clock at night to get a signature on a huge deal with all of the C levels involved. And we've done that. Like we've had those nights, but last night was one of those nights that he even was like, 
ah, you know what? I'm good. <laughs> go hang out, go hang out with your wife and your daughter. It's all good. So, um, and I think that's so important because tomorrow, the next day could be different. We could have a new set of rules. Things could change again, right? Like being able to be adaptable and make good decisions influence, not just at my level, but on their level, knowing how maybe I would have helped them handle it in the past and then re repeating. That tells me that I'm building a trusting relationship where they value my input, but they don't need me to do the things that they're doing, right? Um, so I think I love what you just said. And, and this is, you know, what you're, the advice that you're giving comes from experience and it comes from the mistakes that you've made. You, you learned the boundary because you didn't put up a boundary. And, and this is what, where new salespeople really make a mistake when they, they want to fix everything for everyone. And so this, we, I said, you know, told you earlier, the first piece of advice I give the new salespeople is you get paid for what they do, not where, what you do. You need to internalize that. Number two is that uh, sales management, sales coaching is a language of questions. It's the question that you ask is way more important than anything you say. So when someone comes to you with something that you know they can solve, rather than solving the problem, you begin putting the boundary around those problems by saying, tell me what you would do. Or why don't you go back and think about this and then come back to me with three options yep. so, that, so that when someone calls me at 10 o'clock at night and it's something, I just ask a question and they quickly learn like this per person probably got this like in the middle of doing that, they realized because they'd had that conversation with you before, I got this, I, this is fine and we can do this tomorrow. And as a leader, you, you have to have the emotional control to get out of the way of your own ego, your own need to solve the problem, fix the problem, to be there all the time for everyone yep. and, and realize this person's going to develop if I create the boundary, if I ask the right question, if I make it a little bit uncomfortable for them in this situation so that they start thinking rather than letting me do the thinking for them. Yeah, no, it's so true. I mean, and, and that's the thing, like... <laughs> I think one of the hardest parts that I always struggle with is I do have an ability to solve a problem quickly. And I've been solving the Zoom Info problems for almost four years. I mean, I, I don't know them all. I'm going to find many more. Um, I'm excited to understand the Discover Work piece of our business and how they solve problems. So that's a new challenge for my brain. But like, you bring something to me, I'll probably be able to diagnose it in the first couple, maybe 15 minutes or less of our conversation. But the hardest thing that I challenge the three managers that work for me with their people is to say, hey, you're going to get it fast, right? You have to take a step back, you know, things like, you know, I'd be really interested to see what you'd come back with if you put some thought into this, or have you thought about doing it this way? Or what did you already do? Like everything you just said, if we're not doing that already for anyone listening to this webinar, or watching this one, go try that today, do it in your next interaction, because you will be able to solve the problem. And some people will be fine with it because their paychecks will, will be great for it but you're not going to be able to repeat and scale and grow your team. You'll be stuck with the same sub team. People will look at you to always solve the problems and it will burn you out. It will burn them out. Um, you can't scale dependency. No. So, and, and if you become that, that person that is always solving everybody's problem all the time, that's all you do is you create dependency. People just realize that, you know, you're the, you're, you're the help desk and they just go to you. Yep. And it's hard. Like when you can see the answer, it's hard. What I would challenge you to do, though, is think about um, if you think about like the the like the greatest leader you ever had. Um, think about the, the the person that changed your life, like the person who really uh, made you better. If you really think about it, they never answered your questions. They they always made you come up with the answer. I mean, they always put you in that situation. And sometimes you wanted to throat punch them because you're like, <laughs> give me the damn answer, right? But because they asked the right question, because they provoked awareness that you already knew that, they made you better. And by the way, you love them more because you grew under their leadership. And I think that's, I think that's, a, that's a really hard thing for new salespeople or new sales leaders to do is to recognize that their job essentially, and you kind of said this, is to make themselves obsolete. You, your job is to make your salespeople so good around you. They just don't need you anymore. Yep. Uh, and, and you do that through the questions that you ask and through challenging them to come up with their own answers. And, and you, you alluded to this earlier, but you also have to allow them to make some mistakes. 
you got they they have to lose a deal from time to time. They have to you know to right. blow up a negotiation. They've got to they got to mess up. Now we don't let them break the company. Okay, so we don't let them do that with our biggest opportunities when the quarter's on the line. But most days they're doing little things, and you just got to let them bash their head in a few times so that they learn that's painful. Don't do that again. Yeah. No, I mean, I. I I think that's another that's another philosophy that I learned is that you know even the best salesperson is going to lose like sixty percent of the ops in their pipeline, right? You know maybe you could argue that number is a little different on either side, but you have to learn how to lose before you learn how to win, and then you have to think about why you lost. Again, if your manager's telling you why you lost the whole time, why you, you're probably going to get frustrated with them. You're going to get antagonistic. You're not going to build a foundation of trust, you know, and then you're going to burn out too. But I mean, I, I think the the pillars from what I'm taking from this. Uh, you know, that I think we see some very, very eye to eye consensus around is that in today's world, there has to be that strong foundation that's built day one. Like if you don't have somebody telling you to do this, go do it now. If you just got promoted, if you've been in a management role for a while, the faster you go and make your next interaction with your person that works for you to surprise them and genuinely show them that they are your customer. You are here to help them achieve goal X. And as you've said, Jeb, like you need to define that goal and then you need to reverse engineer backwards what the metrics are that would get you there. You want a house? You want to you know, make $400,000 this year? Well, you got to make some phone calls, but let me help you understand what that actually means. You got to create this many ops. You got to yield this many demos. You got to get this many connects. I'm not asking you to do 100 cold calls a day. I'm asking you to go make $400,000 this year, right? Or 500,000 or a million dollars, whatever your comp plan allows you to get. You know, I, I think I'm also hearing you say, we have to be humble. We have to empower our people to be resourceful. We have to empower our people to, you know, feel comfortable telling us when they need our help, but also knowing that they can go find it themselves. We also have to embrace the fact that we don't know everything either, and that's okay. And it's okay to experience emotion together and experience change together. And, you know, you know, you can't, be given trust, you have to earn it. I mean, that's an old adage, but it's so true is that if all of this doesn't come together, from what I'm hearing you say, people aren't going to follow you. People aren't going to want to run through a wall for you. Um, and we can't expect that just because we have the title that people are going to fall into line. In today's world, there's just too much competition. There's too many great companies to work for. You know, People have the option to go look where they're going to be happy. And if you're not cultivating that garden for them, that safe space for them, that empowered space for them together, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be really, really hard to, to do that. So anything else that you'd want to close with before we take some questions, Jeff, this has been super valuable for me selfishly. I hope it is for everybody else too, but. Yeah. I, the, the one thing that I would say is that we, we, we've kind of skirted around is that you have to be there. And, uh, we were working with a, a, a company out in the Bay area just recently, uh, with their inside sales team. And one of my leaders who was on the project team demonstrated to their leaders how much more productive people can be when the leaders are there. So the leaders were in meetings and they were on email and they were doing reports. And this is an open office. So when I say be there, like I'm talking about, like you got to be with your people that I could see them. They just weren't there. And, um, and so one of my leaders got in and uh, started running, we call them hips, but high intensity prospecting sprint. So we're having a really good time, you know, 15 minutes, 15 dials, just, you know, is, is just as fast as you can. Everybody's, you know, having, you know, just screaming and hollering and clapping. And, uh, and in the middle of it, you know, if there's somebody on the telephone, they got off a bad call, coaching in the moment, working through a negotiation. Hey, I got to hop on the phone with this person and they're going to throw these three objections at me. What do I do? And my leader got in, they had a thousand percent increase in sales and productivity uh, in the month that, that we were on site doing this work with them. And what we were demonstrating to their leaders is that if you want to get your team better, you have to be with them. And this is, this is especially in sales. They're not going to do it on their own. And all of those things that you think is important, going to a dozen meetings and you know, especially when you've got change going on, it's easy to be pulled into meetings. It makes you feel really, really important but you get paid for what your salespeople do, not what you do, and you don't get paid to go to meetings. So I think it's so important for sales leaders that even if you've got a lot of things going on in your day, maybe you have a very demanding workplace that you are scheduling specific time 
to be with your people side by side. If you have a field sales team, that means you need to go get in a car with them. And I'm not just talking about drop, dropping in to, to help them close one deal. I'm talking about going and riding with them where you're having these conversations. And if you work with an inside team uh, of SDRs, BDRs, account executives, whatever, that you are you know, walking around with a rolling chair and just sitting down next to people, sometimes you just sit down and observe. And when you get done, observing you go nice job that was fantastic you move to the next person but your presence will make everyone around you better yeah that's so valuable thank you for joining me for this conversation about leading salespeople in a rapidly changing high growth environment you can pick up a copy of my book people follow you on amazon or audible and if you want to learn more about leading salespeople, we have tons of resources at learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com. 